Elder, I think there was something you just wanted to clarify about uh, some evidence you gave before morning tea. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Free. Um, I said that I thought there were two uh, religious principals in our schools in Melbourne. Uh, I've checked that uh, during the break, and we have six. Thank you. Um, just for your benefit, Mr. Elder, I, I'll come back to the topic that um, you and His Honour were discussing just before morning tea about the situation with the parish priest and and a, a principal. But if uh, you can rest assured, I'll come back to that issue. I just wanted to close yeah. off a couple of other issues. Um, firstly, uh, I asked you before morning tea about the investigations that the Catholic Education Office might get involved in and the circumstances in which it does. Uh, do you, is it your experience that the community expectation is on the part of those who've made complaints and parents and others in the school community, they tend to turn to the CEO uh, when they want to know what's happening with the complaint and they expect you to be the ones handling it? Um, so they have multiple ways that complaints can, they can, as they do, exercise their right to go to their local member of parliament if they want to exercise a complaint about something in respect to a whole multitude of things. They can go to the Victorian Registration and Qualification Authority, uh, who has the right to handle uh, complaints uh, as an independent body. Uh, they can come to uh, the Catholic Education Commission of Victoria or the Catholic Education Office Melbourne or any of the other diocesan offices. So there are multiple points of uh, raising complaints. Thank you. Now, the authority, when you say it has the right to handle complaints, this is the Victorian Registration and Qualifications Authority. Correct. Do, do they have the capacity to investigate complaints themselves? Yes, they do. They have an MOU with us. In the first instance, depending on how they, I suspect, rate the complaint, they can uh, ask my office to investigate it. But whoever makes the complaint has the right to determine whether or not they want my office to investigate it or they want the Victorian Registration and Qualification Authority to investigate it themselves. And I think in uh, one case out of multiple, uh, they've asked the VAQA to uh, investigate. And is that the position <coughs> if a complaint starts with the CEO or if it starts with the authority? In both cases, the complainant has a right to elect? Sorry, give that to Sorry. so I'll... I'll, I'll Take it one step at a time. Yep. If a complainant chooses in the first instance to make a complaint to the Catholic Education Office yes. rather than the authority, yep. can the complainant choose whether your body investigates it or the authority? Yes, they can. Thank you. And the same applies if they make a complaint to the authority? Correct. Um, now, do you have a view about which is more appropriate in the situation where a complaint is made either directly to the Catholic Education Office or comes to the office through the school. Do you have a view about whether it's more appropriate for your office to be investigating it or the authority? So, so well, it depends what the complaint is. If the complaint is that um, Johnny's being bullied at the school, that is something that probably best gets investigated uh, at, um, at the office level. If it is of a higher magnitude, and that is uh, where the complaint is that the principal is uh, misappropriating money, it may well be that the best place for that is with the Victorian Registration and Qualification Office. So what I'm saying is it depends on the magnitude uh, of the complaint and the risk. If the complaint was in relation to uh, the behaviour of a parish priest who's not a teacher or uh, formally involved in the school, although they'll be the employer, as we've mentioned, but their only involvement in the school might be that they're part of the school grounds or live nearby and have some interaction. If the complaint is against that parish priest, um, is that a complaint that can be made to the authority? If it's in respect of the school, yes. Would, would being on school grounds be sufficient to make it a complaint in respect to the school? Um, there has to be an action. Um, if, 
if the priest is the owner and operator of the school and is on the school grounds and has a, all the, the necessary mandated requirements to be there, such as working with children, check, etc., etc., uh, then uh, they are entitled to be on the school site. That'll be the conventional but, position, won't it? Because? That would be the conventional position. Correct. Yeah. Correct. If it is in respect to danger to the child, then the responsibility rests with the individual teacher. The duty of care rests with them. And as I said earlier, we have contractors coming onto school sites. We have parish, the parish priest may come onto the school sites. We have parents who come onto the school sites. We have volunteers who come onto the school sites. The bottom line is the duty of care rests with the teacher. And any engagement, whether they're parents doing reading recovery with the students or whatever, is within the classroom and within uh, sight of the of the teacher. Right. The difficulty is that the relationship between the teacher and the parish priest is one of employer and employee. What you're now identifying is the relationship between the teacher and a volunteer or someone who is there with the permission of the teacher. That's, there's a real difference, isn't there? In part, there could be, Your Honour, yes. In part? Well, so there's yes. a real difference. Yes. Um, just dwelling on that. But if it goes to the duty of care of the child, and if that's the point that we're trying to get to here, it doesn't matter if it's the parish priest or whoever, and volunteers come into our schools, parents have a right to come into our schools as well. If it's about the duty of care of the child, that rests with the teacher. So the priest has no more entitlement uh, in respect to that child and someone who comes in as a volunteer or whatever. No, the teacher lives with the prospect that if the priest doesn't like what they're doing, the priest can sack them. No, no, because there are now... Uh, we have Fair Work Australia. Well, so, the, so subject, to the, saying, the, subject to all the industrial controls, the yeah. priest remains the employer, correct? Correct. But at the same time, the teacher has rights under uh, legislation in this country to take that matter to Fair Work Australia as the teacher did, who we sacked, who took it to VCAP and got a payout. You're not concerned, Mr Elder, that in that scenario, because of the employer-employee relationship, it might bear on the employee's choice in the first place. Do I make an issue about this and raise a complaint? So, um, so, so the whole point that you're making gets to the point of governance. And let me tell you, across education in this country, there are different governance models. Yes. Across every state in Australia, there are different governance models. Across long daycare centres in Australia, in the 0 to 5 vulnerable age group, there are different models of governance. My view about governance is fundamentally about um, the standards, the governance standards that are in place. And this top-down approach is where government says these are the standards that you must adhere to. And so let me say to you that the, the government of Victoria has all these standards that it applies to our school. It tells us what curriculum we must teach in respect to BCD. It tells us what we must do in respect to child safe standards. It tells us how many days a year off we can have on holidays. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And this is the compliance regime that exists when you accept money from government about the way you govern and conduct your school. So the governance standards are the anchor point. Do you think that's a good thing, Mr Alder? Absolutely. Mr Alder, can I ask you just to focus on your governance model? Yep. Sorry, before you move on, uh, the issue with a parish priest being an employer uh, goes quite significantly to the issue of competence and ability. Yep. Uh, the parish priest might well be a fine person, but in both secular and religious schools, they are employed by professionals in the education sector. And there is a, um, uh, a body of knowledge and experience, uh, and that's exhibited in the Catholic Education Offices, which is uh, highly informed in the education sense. For a 
priest without that background and training to effectively be, be the employer in a school um, strikes me as somewhat antiquated. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point that you raise, uh, Your Honour. Um, and so, in Australia, I suppose we have a mixed bag. We have a whole lot of uh, priests who have uh, an undergraduate degree, which basically says they're relatively bright people who have um, um, received an undergraduate degree at uh, university standard expectation. There are some prior to that who are much older priests who didn't uh, have that, uh, who haven't got that. But in the main, uh, most priests uh, who were trained, after I suspect, I don't know, I think about 75, have an undergraduate degree. So that basically goes to the point that they are people who have a reasonable intelligence because they've been able to get that degree. If the point that you are making is that... Um, the other point that I would make is that the parish priest is advised by his principal, vice-principal and the leadership team within the school. And they have a lot of competence in the space of education. If you look at the State Department of Education and the employer there is, I suspect, the secretary of the department, the last three secretaries of the State Department of Education, one was an economist, one was a mechanical engineer, and the other one, I think, the current one, I think, is a social worker. To say that they are, uh, as the employer of teachers in state schools, incompetent, I think would be drawing a long bow. My view is that principals are supported, uh, sorry, priests are supported in the role in governance of their school by the education professionals who are employed. Mr Elder, the problem is when they don't get on, when they don't perform as they should, that's the problem. Who doesn't perform as they should? Well, either the priest or the teacher. Yeah. Now, you, you really, I, I have to say to you, you're not addressing the issue that the Searson problem threw up. So you, you're, you're addressing... So, Your Honour, I'm looking forward to you bringing down your report mm. on Dufton in the coming weeks. Mm. Um, I think... And I don't want to get into the... I'm looking to the learnings that you bring forward in respect to Dufton. What, what I would say to you is that things have changed. And the things that have changed is, again, all the dynamics that impact on the governance of a school. We now have reported, uh, mandatory reporting. We have changes to the Crimes Act. Uh, we have uh, more informed... Well, we have joint protocols about child safe standards. We have school licensing by the state. We have teacher registration. We have student wellbeing officers in every school. We have Fair Work Australia if people are being threatened for their job, which they can appeal to and get, uh, uh, get compensated. On top of that, I mean, in my own office, I have my own, we've restructured our own offices to ensure that we have people who are qualified to go out and do investigations. But on top of that, there is a major cultural shift as well. And that is, the cultural shift is that back in the Dovedon's days, father was held on a pedestal. The understandings today, because of everything that's happened, is that father has the same failings as any other human being. And uh, so there is a more accountability around the way they go in, in, in governing their schools. So there's been this major cultural shift from what happened with Dovedon to now. And I think governments and yourselves have recognised this, and this is why you've put out your papers, which I think have been fantastic because it has basically held people to account like myself against standards and to look at the way we go about the business in, in Catholic education. Governance is what it is. There are multiple governance uh, options across this country. The real thing that holds people to account is the standards... And the strongest standards are the standards that are imposed by an external authority, such as state governments, who then actually hold you accountable against those standards. Gentlemen uh, from the other states, uh, is there any other state in Australia where the parish priest is the employer? Not across Australia, Your Honour. Queensland? Not that I'm aware of. Do we know of any other state where the parish priest is the employer? 
Mr. Elder, do you know of any other? Um, no, I know of different governance models across education, Your Honour. Do you know of any other state in which the parish priest is the employer? No. Mr. Elder, can I perhaps focus on your governance model by asking you to consider this scenario? Yeah. Um, you're a teacher in a parish school in the Archdiocese of Melbourne in the playground before school and you, you see a distressed child coming out of the presbytery. Um, you've got concerns about what's gone on and whether the priest might have um, engaged in misconduct. Now, one of the concerns which has been raised about having the dynamic of the priest being the employer of that teacher is that it might make the teacher feel inhibited about making a complaint. Now, is, is the effect of what you're saying that the teacher draws sufficient comfort from things like their industrial rights that they'll be not inhibited? There are far more protections now than historically looking back at Dumpton. The onus is on the teacher. The changes to the Crimes Act 1958 says failure to protect, failure to disclose and grooming now come into play. There is no ambiguity around this. No ambiguity. And that teacher is held personally responsible for their failure to comply with the law of Victoria. Um, Mr Elder, one of the other criticisms which has been expressed of the arrangement of having the parish priest have those responsibilities uh, is that it adds to the workload of the parish priest in a way which makes a difficult job even harder. Do you have a view on, on that? It varies. Of course, it varies from parish to parish. There are some priests who are, who are working extremely hard and uh, who are, haven't got large amounts of time. There are others who uh, have much time and can be far more involved. But uh, at the end of the day, um, we should not overlook the role of the principal who handles the day-to-day -day operational matters in the school with the teachers. Thank you. Um, can I ask you, please, to consider the scenario which I've asked um, Dr Macdonald and Mr Hill about? If, now, firstly, as I understand under your policies, if a complaint is made in relation to the behaviour of a diocesan priest, the report which has to be made is to the Professional Standards Office of the Archdiocese. Is that right? Uh, no. In the school scenario, no. The school scenario, if it is in respect to a matter involving a child in our school, their first responsibility is to report it under the amendments to the 1958 Crimes Act where they must uh, protect and disclose. Sorry, Mr Elder, I, I didn't mean to suggest that's the only report they make, but part, there may be reports to the police or human services, depending upon the nature of the complaint. Right. But is there also a complaint made to the Professional Standards Office of the Archdiocese? I can't, I, I can't answer that because I don't know. You don't know what procedure would be applied if a complaint was made in relation to a parish priest? No, only as it, only as it applies to the school. Well, assume that. Assume that it related to something that the parish priest had done on the school. Does the archdiocese get involved in responding to that complaint? Uh, no. Not at all? Well, my experience in the 10 years that I've been there um, is that, um, one... Uh, in the 10 years that I've been the director in the office, I know of no case where the parish priest has abused a child in the schooling uh, environment. Right. Uh, I'm just trying to understand what would happen if a complaint arose next week or next year. Um, if, the, if, if, if the complaint arose, the onus, uh, from, from a schooling perspective, the onus is on the principal or the teacher or anyone else within the school because now it doesn't put it into categories of nurses, health professionals or whatever. Yes. Anyone in Victoria must report. And they must report to the police. Um, what about 
the religious orders, if taking, for instance, one of the principles you've referred to, if there was a complaint about them, would the superior of that religious community become involved? Legislatively, I don't know. It would, it would be determined, I suspect, locally. But let me tell you what the law says again. Failure to protect and fail to disclose and grooming is a crime. So therefore, the personal onus is on the principal, the teacher or anyone else within that school to report it. Whether they report to the congregational leader, um, I don't know. I don't know what the protocols are, but their obligation is to report it to them and to report it uh, to my office. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little about the project, which we understand from the Archbishop's statement is being developed relating to something called the Polonius database? Uh, yeah, OK. So, again, in order to ensure that we had um, a system in place that basically tracked uh, everything, we bought uh, a system called Polonius, which is a knowledge and data tool which, uh, which uh, captures complaints, uh, and these are tracked and managed. They probably spent over a million bucks on the installation of it, including licences on going. Uh, and we're also going to expand that uh, to capture other things such as um, industrial issues, because as I said earlier, sometimes industrial issues uh, manifest that child abuse may happen down the track, and also to track wellbeing within the school as well. So the system that we bought that we're building on it and uh, looking to expand. So it is a tool. Is is that going to involve consolidation of historical files? Um, my understanding is yes, but I would need to check that. Thank you. Um, what about in relation to information that interstate authorities um, might have that are relevant to the kind of conduct issues that your office investigates. Are you aware of any resources that enable you to find out if other offices in other states hold information that might be relevant to one of your people? Abuse takes place in state schools, Catholic schools and independent schools. And um, my understanding is that the regulators who look at this, including each of the state regulators, are looking at, an, this is my understanding, are looking at an Australia-wide system that captures everything. I would say at the moment there are holes that probably exist because I have a teacher who was uh, accused of abusing someone in a um, state school who works in our school but still have their registration. So... But my understanding, all the regulators are looking at an Australian-wide model that captures all this information, yes. which, would, which would be most welcome. On a related point, you, you mentioned earlier one example of where an investigation that your office had conducted led to a member of staff being terminated. Yeah. Um, firstly, in that situation of termination, do you advise the Teachers' Registration Board of that action? Uh, yes, we do. What... A, what about if a teacher is encouraged to resign, as sometimes happens, rather than termination? Um, again, there is no ambiguity around that. It must be, it must be reported to the Victorian Institute of Teachers. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Mr Crowley, thank you, Mr Elder. Can I just turn to you, please? Firstly, um, on the topic of the structural model of having... Uh, a, a priest act as a, an employer to a principal. Mm. Now, that, that's not your situation, is it? No, it's not. Who, who's your employer? So my employer is Edmund Rice Education Australia, so I'm employed um, by the executive director. Thank you. Um, in the pricey that you've provided to the commission of your views, um, you, you've indicated s some concerns that you would have about that kind of arrangement. Can you just outline for us why you think... Sorry, which kind of... I'm sorry, an arrangement whereby 
the priest was your employer, you've said that might cause some difficulties. Can you just tell us what your own perspective is? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily share the same view as, as Steve. I, I respond to that question from the perspective of having been a principal, secondary principal, in regional settings, so in country settings where um, you may have a relationship where the, the primary school principal is employed by the parish priest. And I, I, think, I think the issue um, that Your Honour raised is around um, not necessarily specific examples of where um, there has been abuse and the principal hasn't reported it. It's around the likelihood for that to happen. And so from where I sit, as a secondary um, principal em employed by Edmund Rice Education Australia, I am delegated to make the decisions in my school. So um, on a whole range of issues, I would consult, um, I would consult my lawyers and we, we have a very close relationship that I've developed over my two years at the school where we often um, say we want briefings on how we perhaps should um, engage on a particular issue. We would talk to professional standards at the Catholic Education Office in Melbourne. I would talk to Edmund Rice Education Australia. I, I would talk to the police. So there would be many um, bodies and um, people with great wisdom that could help me navigate through uh, a decision if I found that, that I needed some assistance with regards to that. Um, the protect resources are very clear too for principals now in Victoria in terms of following those through and, and responding. But ultimately, I make that decision, having taken on the wisdom of, of a whole range of, of bodies who are experts in those field, and do so always with the best interest of the students, as, as all principals um, would, would do. Where, where I have the concern is that... Um, that there's a very human element, I think, when when your boss, when you're the principal and your boss is the parish priest. And uh, I'm not saying for one second that the principal wouldn't respond according to law, legislation, um, compliance requirements, all of that. But I, I think it's the that human nature that is there that the potential for for that not to go as it should. That's where, that's where my concern lies. And I think also, too, having had many conversations with colleagues who, who are primary school principals, um, that sometimes the expertise in HR as a principal... You know, there's a lot of stuff to get your head around as a principal these days. You're not just, you know, you're not just in, involved in the learning and teaching. There is a whole complexity in being a principal. And, um, you know, the principal is, is the expert there. So I guess... Um, the concern also around the pressures that that might, that might put on priests to be those experts and potentially um, putting um, situ scenarios in place. It might be, for example, where the, the students in a primary school are, are going off to uh, an excursion and there's a certain ratio that needs to be in place there for that to happen safely and those are very clearly documented. Well, could there be the potential for the principal to say we're doing one thing and the parish priest to say, well, maybe without that expertise might might not have the same insight. So I, I, I guess they're probably the areas that where I where I have some difficulty with that with that model. And you're drawing upon your conversations with I assume multiple principals when you make those comments. Yeah, I mean certainly um, in my context as a principal of a regional school, we would meet often with with primary school principals in the region. Um, I wouldn't say that um, it's many, but certainly I've had that conversation um, where where the principal at times has to you know has to um, navigate around that relationship and, and work very hard to get their you know their their direction across or, or be very headstrong there. Yeah. What's the reason why it's thought of an appropriate model, Mr. Helder? I'm not saying it's not an appropriate. What I'm saying is there are multiple governors. No, no, no. Why, why is it thought that this is an appropriate model to have the priest? as the employer in the parish school? Because I'm trying to follow the, their logic. It, it may well be that, uh, that he reports to Wayne Tinsey, who is the CEO of Edmund Rice Australia, and he may have the same problem with Wayne Tinsey as he would have with a, with a priest. No, I'm, not it, sure, it's, I'm, it's, I'm not sure there's a parallel there, because, like your comment upon education departments, uh, Edmund Rice are uh, professionals in education. The parish priest may not be. That's the difference. 
Have you been through the board of Edmund Rice Education Australia? I'm not talking about the board. I'm talking about the people who are in that organisation with responsibility in relation to the running of the schools within their care. Same with an education department. Whether the uh, head of the education department has a Bachelor of Education may not matter very much, but what does matter is the qualifications and experience of the people who work within that department. Yeah. Now, the difference with a parish priest, there may be some very good ones, there may be very good educationists, but obviously some will not be. That's, yeah, the, that's I, the difference. I, and I understand you, Honour. And the point that I'm making is that different governance models, the things that actually hold people to account is ultimately where the power and authority rests. Could you help and me with that? Who can, who can me with answering my question? And who can impose sanctions? No, no, no. Could you help me with answering my question? Why is that thought to be an appropriate model? I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm saying there are multiple models of governance. Mm. You're putting forward one model of governance. I could put forward probably another 10 different models of governance. What I'm actually saying is that when you sit down and analyse all of them, there may be flaws. But the one thing that always counts is the governance standards for which they're held accountable against. And that ultimately determines who has the power and authority to implement those governance standards. And in education in Victoria or across this country, it's a top-down model. The state says you must do this, particularly in respect to child protection and a whole raft of other things. And what I'm saying is the great strength is his governance model may not be ideal, the governance model that exists in Catholic schools may not be ideal in Victoria, but the governance model in state schools. But the one thing that holds them all to account is the governance standards, because that's the anchor point against which the accountability frame rests. I'll have one more attempt. Can you give me reasons why the model which has the parish priest as the employer would be chosen as the model for your education system? The point that I make to you, you've, you've singled out one governance model, Your Honour, mm. and what I'm saying to you is there are multiple governance options in this country in respect to education. Non-government schools, some of them have um, boards uh, or companies limited by guarantee. Um, in Victoria, we have a different model for education. In the state system in Victoria, for some time, they had self-managing schools where effectively the employment of staff was pushed out to the school level. I'm saying there are multiple governance models, whatever they are, the thing that at the end of the day makes sense is the governance standards against which they must report and where the authority and power rests. And in the case of Victoria, it is with the state government on, on in particular around child safe standards and a whole lot of other things. Um, Mr Crowley, uh, St Patrick's in Ballarat that you now lead as the headmaster has a particularly troubled past with child sexual abuse, um, something you must have been very conscious of when you took on the job. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly I was, I was aware of um, parts of the history. It would be fair to say that um, I wasn't... Um, I, I didn't anticipate... Um, the journey that we were about to go on as a school in its fullest extent, but I certainly had an understanding of what I what I was getting into two years ago when I was appointed, and I certainly did that, um, recognising that it, that um, we had a part of our history that needed to be acknowledged, and we needed to openly engage in. Can you tell the commissioners what steps you've taken to try and acknowledge that and engage with it? Um, well, I think the first sitting for uh, the Royal Commission in Ballarat was in February... It might have been May in my, my first year in 2015. It was very early on in that year. And the Royal Commission organised the opportunity for uh, a number of um, people who, who represented different sections of the Ballarat community to come together. And I guess it was a session to just put on the table our fears, what we were worried about, our concerns and and what we, what we hoped as a, as a community to, to be able to work through you know, with the hope that, that as a community we can move forward. 
and I think that that was a wonderful opportunity then to to establish some relationships there. And so um, from from that, um, myself and Eileen Rice, who's the the principal of St Olympia's Primary School in Ballarat, um, we met with um, a small group uh, initially of men. Those men were made up of um, uh, victims of abuse from my school, from St Patrick's College. And um, I, I guess in, in those um, initial conversations, we weren't really sure what to say or what to do. It was, it was difficult, but we all seemed to have um, a connection that it was important for us in terms of moving forward as a community that we did meet. And so um, the questions that we, that we asked in those initial meetings, we used to just, I used to just ring up um, some victims and some survivors who were part of the group and say, can we meet for a, a bowl of soup down at the cafe? And we, we sort of met there every fortnight. The questions, what, what are we meeting for? What, what do we need to do to move forward into the future? Um, and in the words of, of one survivor, and he often says this to me, something good has got to come of this, something good. And so I've always had that ringing in my ears, and Eileen has too. So we started to ask those questions, and instead of, instead of us being the ones talking, we both felt very strongly that we needed to listen, just to um, engage in a conversation where we basically just kept quiet and listened, listened from the victims and survivors how we could support them, how, how our com community could support them, how the community of Ballarat could support them. And so we were, we were led in on a very personal journey and um, I'm very honoured to have been able to, as Eileen is, I'm sure, to be part of that journey. So some of the things that we talked about and, and were identified that we have been focusing on uh, in many ways over the last two years the first and I think the most important one was um, open acknowledgement of this part of our history, that um, there are no excuses. No, um, it, it, it is what it is and we need to acknowledge that fully. Um, and, and I believe that um, we've done that and it hasn't always been an easy journey, but I think that um, certainly from a very personal perspective, the most hopeful people that, I, that I've experienced on the journey are these um, men and women uh, who are victims and survivors that, that, that we've been working with. So how did the acknowledgement um, develop? Well, in, in many ways, um, I became more confident and more vocal in the paper and in the press to be able to say, this is part of our history and, and we need to acknowledge this. I, and I've had ex unbelievable unbelievable support from the Ballarat community in doing that, from my college board, um, from the school community, the parent community, who, who have um, never once made me feel as though we're doing anything that we absolutely shouldn't be, and that is walking in solidarity with victims and survivors. So, so um, more, more confidence in, in that message. Um, I think people will know that um, <coughs> there was a real turning point for us in the acknowledgement of of our history in the area of sexual abuse, and it was when three of my senior leaders in Year 12 knocked at my door, literally, at uh, one lunchtime and said, Mr Crowley, we're watching what's going on and we want to say, we want to say something. And I have to, have to say, initially, I thought, OK, um, I knew um, that, that that would be in the press and um, I guess as an educational leader, there comes a point where you have to trust um, you have to put faith in your students because I think sometimes we think that they're not listening and they're not looking, and they are. In fact, they're probably on social media 20 times quicker than I could be in terms of um, conversations and things that are going on there. And I said, OK, gentlemen, what, what do you want to do? And they said, well, we want to do three things. We want to write a letter. We want to acknowledge the hurt fully and openly. We want to stress... Um, and reassure victims and survivors that St Patrick's College today is not the same school. So that was very important for them to articulate that message that they are safe. And the third, and the third one was that they wanted to commit um, as a school community to walking in solidarity. So they wrote the letter. I said, I always go away and, and, and draft it up. And they came back the very next day and said, here it is. And so we published that. 
that was a real turning for, point for us, I think, as a school, and I think also within the community. I received a number of phone calls from, from survivors who were um, past students of the school who had been abused, just thanking us and saying what a wonderful thing that was um, that the boys took that initiative and we had victims come back into the school to have lunch with the boys and to acknowledge and spend the time to talk to the boys about what the impact that they had had. So that, that acknowledgement um, has been one of the things that, that's come through that, that conversation. The other, the other area that I think has been integral to the conversation that, that we've been privileged to have with victims and survivors has been um, for them to know that the school is a safe place. And so that's, that's um, been a great blessing to me as a leader, that through um, the new ministerial order that we've been able to uh, revisit procedures and policies and, and, and processes to make sure that if the bar's here, we're here. And, and we have that goal, that we want to keep moving forward um, in the best way we can. And so, um, as a group, um, and by that stage, we had some very respected people in, in healthcare come on board to help us with the conversation. We started investigating what curriculum resources are out, out there, um, not, not just around child protection, because we knew as a school that the new uh, ministerial order was, spoke very strongly to um, the new standards, but also around the importance of mindfulness, developing resilience in young people, um, giving young people the skills to be able to identify when behaviours are in front of them that are not, are not right and, and really being able to um, give them the skills to have a voice and, and know who to speak to. So um, we looked at a whole range of possibilities and one of the survivors I work with was very strong on mindfulness and very learned. And he was able to share that knowledge um, with Eileen and myself in a way that drew us to a curriculum that was operating out of South Australia, the Department of Education, and had been rolled out to all Catholic schools. And so we started investigating that and speaking to the people who were responsible for authoring that. The Catholic Education Office in Ballarat came on board and we approached Bishop Paul Bird and said, we, we, we would like to trial this program. And he, he um, said that he would be happy for that to happen and thought it was a good idea under the auspices of the, the office. And so we have entered into a negotiated contract with the Department of Education in South Australia. We've, we've signed up on contracts and we're about to start trialling that curriculum in our schools as a response to one of the child safe standards around giving students that voice, the skills to be able to identify where appropriate behaviour is not being demonstrated to them. So um, that, that was, I think... Um, an, an absolute honour to, to be part of that conversation and actually um, produce something very meaningful and tangible in terms of the safety of children. And so uh, we're rolling that out through the pastoral care program at St Patrick's College this year, um, our child safe officer. Also, uh, um, the conversation around um, making reassuring victims and survivors that St Patrick's College is not the same school today was... Um, led us to a whole range of, of in, in, um, appointments. We employed a director of HR with a very strong legal background, a past lawyer, who's been able to guide the school and the staff expertly through the process of introducing um, the seven child safe standards, ministerial order, understanding what that can look like, training staff in to protect resources. How do you respond? when something comes across your desk or you hear a conversation with a student so that everyone is part of that. So uh, all of that initiative has come through that, one, that, that initial conversation of sitting down and saying we want to listen about how, how we can move forward as, as a school in our relationship with you and as a community. Thank the you. thing that I know that Eileen and, and I am most proud of is that... Um, we have been able to reconnect past students with our schools. And um, people may know that um, the day that 
um, a survivor came and stood at the front of the gate to St Patrick's College with me, standing next to him, and we were photographed. And there was a, a wonderful, beautiful story that was published in the Age about that you know, his journey and the damage that had been inflicted on him, um, and then the journey that we had been on in terms of the work at schools it was a very proud moment for us as a school. So. Um, reconnecting where it's desired with the school. Um, another um, survivor once said to me that for the first time he felt like an old boy of the school. And so when that's said to you, that just uh, uh, motivates you to say, well, this is, this is so important. So um, that initial meeting has been a gift to us and um, we are so thankful that we've had the opportunity. We will continue to, as a school community, we will continue to, to engage in conversations with victims and survivors in terms of how we can support them. Because I think one of the things that has struck me through, throughout this whole journey, and, and really um, I didn't understand it until, until I had the opportunity to walk in solidarity with victims and survivors, was the damage that had been done to them, the, the absolute devastation. There wouldn't be one meeting one gathering, one lunchtime, where, where one of the members of the team didn't take a phone call from another victim and survivor who was suffering, who, who was um, really distressed. And, and um, that's really hard to watch someone who, who themselves find it hard at times to get out of bed and come along and have a meeting about look, this horrible appalling abuse and at the same time be the person who's, who's providing that support. So there's, there is so much work to do in terms of redress and um, the importance of, of providing safety nets for people and, and providing that ongoing counselling and support. One, one thing, practical thing that, that has also come out of the conversations for us as a school is that we've employed an alumni officer whose job it is to harness the the huge power of our old boys. We've got thousands and thousands of, of past students. We're putting together a database. And then um, we need to work out as a school how we can connect with past old boys, including victims and survivors, who, who are desperately doing it tough. How do we connect? And, and, for example, someone who just needs their lawn mowed, someone who cannot get their finances together, um, some, someone who needs professional assistance. So tapping into that database as a school and ringing that old boy up who's donated their service and say, we've got someone here, we need you to talk to them. So, so we're also um, putting our energies in, into that. So I, I think, um, and that's just a very personal um, summary f from a school perspective. Um, Mr Crowley, I, I'm conscious of the time. I, I recognise the improvements in child safety protection that you've outlined to us. Um, what has been exercising my mind is how you stress test, which is a phrase used in financial prudence, how you stress test a system to see whether in fact it is robust and is indeed providing the safety that you've outlined. And I want to talk to you briefly about a very instructive experience for the Royal Commission and that was our case study six into a Toowoomba primary school and that was in 2007 so it's relatively current and it concerned the employment and re-employment of a teacher against whom child sexual abuse allegations had been made. Now there were five protective mechanisms which would imply that that school should have been child safe. Firstly, there was a state accreditation, regulation and reporting regime in practice. Secondly, the bishop, the ultimate authority over that school, was able and responsive in matters of child protection. Thirdly, there was a professionally run and uh, uh, capable child, uh, sorry, Catholic education office. Fourthly, there was a quite um, uh, deep and extensive range of policies and procedures with respect to child protection. Fifthly, there was in-service training, annually at least. And yet, 
there were great failings uh, at the school by the principal, by staff members, and by the Catholic Education Office, which allowed for children to continue to be put at risk. So when someone says to me, my school is now safe, I think I'll accept it safer. Um, what do you do to test whether that safety is, is real? How do you audit, enforce, stress test? Uh, do your very best to make sure that somebody who should be reporting is and that proper procedures uh, are understood and that the training has worked. Yes, I agree. I mean, our goal is to be the safest possible school we can be. And I think part of that is to consistently, um, with staff, re uh, re reinform them, re -inform them of the processes that are in place, making sure that we are ever mindful of consistently setting aside regular time to make sure processes are clear, followed, open conversations with teachers in terms of how they're finding those processes, so test, testing those out through conversation, making, making child safety related matters um, something that is part of the fabric of the school, the conversation that goes on making sure that everyone understands their role. And, and part of that is um, through the appointment of a director of HR who's working in, con in conjunction with a director of oh and risk management to make sure that those conversations are going on. So I, I think from, from my perspective, um, you, you can never sit still. It's about that ongoing conversation day in, day out about things that are in place looking at ways in which um, processes can be um, improved, procedures can be improved. Um, for example, at our school, with, with working with children checks, uh, we've um, gone through the whole process of saying, well, what, what is included in the Act? Am so, I, can I interrupt you? Uh, yeah. do you? Do you do role plays? Uh, you heard Mr Free earlier um, uh, talk about scenarios. One of the instructive ways business trains people is to role play mm. and use scenarios. Um, do, do you use modern techniques of training? Um, at my past school, we had uh, the VIT come in and talk through role modelling, so examples. Um, that would be something that we could do more of at St Patrick's College, saying, so, no, the answer is no, but that would be one way that we could do that. But certainly... Um, um, the examples through the conversations with the Director of HR and legal advice around specific examples is a very good learning tool that we could develop more. Thank you. Um, just finally, uh, Mr Crowley, uh, you've referred in your pricey to some instructions that the Bishop of Ballarat has given about how the Sacrament of Reconciliation should be carried out in schools. I assume that's generally in the diocese rather than just your school, is that right? Ah, that would be correct, yes. What, what are the key principles now about how it should be dealt with? Yes, so um, I think it was around the middle of last year, no, maybe a little earlier than that, the Bishop um, sent a letter out to all schools, um, establishing a protocol for confession where it occurs at schools, so that is that it's in an open place, um, clearly visible. So at St Patrick's College, uh, we offer... As part of our RE program, um, confession at year ten, lot, not a large number of students take that up, but uh, it, it is done at the back of the chapel in open view. So um, the boys would just simply walk down the back, and, and everyone can see what's going on there. Is the practice more uh, common in at primary schools? Do you know? I couldn't comment. I, I, I would suspect so, but I, I wouldn't be able to comment there. I know it occurs in, in, in Year 10 at our school, yes. um, and few students take up that, that offer. Thank you. Can I ask... Opportunity. I'm sorry. Mr Hill, can I ask you, are there any specific directives in the Archdiocese of Brisbane about how the Sacrament of Reconciliation should be carried out with students? 
I am aware of protocols the Archbishop has provided to priests of the Archdiocese in relation to working with children in relation to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Well, what are they? Uh, I'm not that familiar with them, Mr. Free, to be perfectly honest with you, but I can speak from my experience as a principal in a primary school and working with priests uh, through, as a teacher and, and, and uh, assistant principal over the years. It would be very similar uh, circumstance that have, has been described, essentially where you would have children who are preparing for the Sacrament of Reconciliation. That would be parish-based. Uh, it means that the school's at arm's length in relation to the preparation for that sacrament. When it came to the actual um, offering of the sacrament, it may occur with a, a class of, of primary school students a couple of times a year. There would be preparation done with the parish priest and the, and the teacher, um, and then th that sacrament would be offered uh, in a church uh, where the priest would be um, on the sanctuary or somewhere else uh, in open view um, and students would be invited to voluntarily participate in that sacrament. Thank you. Um, Dr MacDonald, then. Mr Fred, there's no, as far as I know, any diocese, any written protocols on the, the celebration of the sacrament. Um, it would be common practice in WA primary schools that the sacrament happens, uh, which is celebrated in the parish, but preparation happens in the school that uh, it's all done in the open um, on the sanctuary. There'll be multiple priests, multiple points to go to, um, and really would rely on the duty of care and normal processes, but there's nothing documented. Thank you. And Mr Elder, I think we've seen the Archbishop in Melbourne has issued a specific written... Yeah, clear, clear policy uh, and directive to all uh, parish priests. Thank you. Um, nothing further, Commissioners. Thank you. Mr Gray. Very briefly. Your Honour. Just to you, uh, Dr MacDonald, you mentioned in um, answer to a question you were asked that um, there was critical incident reporting now, uh, but that you didn't have the figures at your fingertips at the time, and I think you now do. Could you tell the Commission uh, what the position is in that regard? Thank you, Mr Gray. Yes, because um, I asked around about the critical incidents. We have um, approximately 15,000 staff in Catholic Education Western Australia. And last year, I submitted uh, 274 critical incidents to Department of Education Services. And uh, the breakdown, 30 of those were in the category of um, sexual abuse. And that could be historic, outside, the, outside of the school, because the manager reports don't in, so therefore it's critical, or it could be um, peer to peer or teacher to, to student. Um, on those figures, uh, the 30, I'm aware that one of them is against a teacher and two of those incidents were against non-teaching staff, a sports coach and a boarding supervisor. The other 27, I haven't got a breakdown exactly what they were for, what categories. And are you able to say whether all of them or any of them were incidents which, although reported to the school, nevertheless didn't happen at the school? <coughs> I, can't, I couldn't give you exact numbers on that, um, but given that one's against a teacher and two are non-teaching staff, the majority would come from outside the school where the student has confided in the teacher that this has happened, uncle or whatever it might be in the family home, etc., and therefore we've made the mandatory report. Yes, and to your knowledge, were any of those, did any of those critical incidents uh, relate to a religious person, a priest or a brother, for example? No, it's best of my knowledge, no. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That brings, <coughs> brings this discussion to an end. It's necessary to excuse you, but can I thank you, each of you, for your contribution. Obviously, given the statistical analysis, the situation in relation to the safety of schools is a fundamental issue, both, of course, for the Catholic community, but for the whole community. And you people are really one of the pinnacle areas where um, the opportunity to ensure that schools operate safely uh, is available. So we commend uh, you for the work you do and thank you for coming to talk to us. Thank you. Thank we'll you adjourn all. until two.